Uh, my name is Meghna. I'm a MLOps engineer. I like to take my coffee instant because I'm lazy. So my name is Yamashadu. I'm a data science manager and uh, I, mean, I love coffee in very diverse types, but my favorite one, I guess, is end the morning at home with uh, my coffee machine with like a, a long coffee, but also very strong. So that's all. I'm Tiramana, I'm a data science manager, and I like my coffee, like cappuccino, but with Oatly, uh, to be a bit hipster. Uh, my name is Olivia Houghton, I'm a machine learning operations engineer. Uh, my favorite way to drink coffee is to drink hot chocolate, but pretend I'm drinking like really bitter coffee and go, ooh, oh, I'm so tough. Uh, but yeah. Welcome back to another MLOps Community Podcast. Today we are talking to four different people from the Get Your Guide team. As you just heard, we've got MLOps engineers, we've got data scientists, we've got the likes of it. And I thoroughly enjoyed talking with this team because they are so transparent about how they built their ML platform and what they tried to leverage, what they decided they were going to focus on and why. And it felt to me like they had been through some trials and tribulations, but they're open about talking about it. And that is always super useful for the rest of us because we get to learn from their baptism by fire. I know it's not the nicest way to go through it and learn your lessons, but hopefully we don't have to go through it too. So they talked all about what they were focusing on and how the evolution of their ML platform came how they interface with the greater data platform. And I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation because I love going to the Get Your Guide office in Berlin. Shout out to the Berlin chapter of the local MLOps community meetups. If you haven't checked out a local MLOps community meetup yet, I highly encourage you to go do that. They're happening around the world. So go check out one of the local meetups and... It would mean the world to me if you share this episode with one friend. Go ahead and click share. We'll get into this episode. So Theo, you wrote on the form that you are the perfect French cliche. Your parents own a vineyard which I am amazed about. I imagine you grew up drinking amazing wine from the time you were two or even when you were teething. Maybe your parents gave you some red wine to take away the pain. And the only reason I think about that is because my daughter right now is teething and I heard that giving shots of rum is the way to do it uh, so that they sleep. Anyway, man, I'm excited to have everybody from the Get Your Guide team on here. And I think it's probably worth diving into, and I'll start with you, Theo, first, the French cliche himself, what exactly does the Get Your Guide ML platform look like, and how does it integrate with the greater data platform and foundation? Yeah. Uh, hi. So, yeah, maybe first the ML platform. Actually, let's go back to this origin. So, it coming from the uh, kind of uh, retro initiatives about our engineering standards and actually it was during COVID times and at Get Your Guide, so marketplace or travel experiences during COVID times, uh, you can expect the, our business revenue were pretty down. So actually what we uh, worked on were this foundation and this ML platform was actually our, uh, one of the big foundation that we wanted to have for the future when uh, tourism will bounce back. So what uh, what we have basically is uh, an our platform to uh, to be able to operate, to quickly launch and uh, operate uh, machine learning uh, systems or how we call it, more specifically data products. And here I think the main thing that was key for us was having a strong partnership 
with, between a data scientist, uh, myself uh, and Jean, uh, an engineering. And also we get a, a strong vision from the upper management on top. Um, so that's give us basically kind of the overall ideas where it comes from. And now maybe we can dive in a bit more. Maybe just a compliment here. Uh, yeah, I think it's very much worth to shout out for Mathieu Bastian, our kind of a uh, manager that uh, has been sponsoring this uh, initiative since the beginning. And we know that is very challenging for management for like bet on something so long term. And uh, uh, but uh, here we see like uh, yeah, since COVID times that this had been flourishing and many of new iterations. And we learn and we make so much better machine learning production out of this project. So we should probably maybe rewind just a little bit because you all are working at Get Your Guide. And for those that aren't familiar with Get Your Guide, as you mentioned, Theo, it is a marketplace for guides to offer tours, any kind of tours, I would imagine. Travel experiences. So you can think uh, in, indeed of guided tours, but also museum entrance tickets or day trips also will count uh, things like a uh, food tour will be also the kind of things or bar, bar crawling is also the type of thing that we uh, propose on our uh, platform. Nice. Just as a side note, so my brother and sister came to visit me and after they were coming to visit me, they went to Berlin and my uh, brother's girlfriend was floored by the amount of offerings that they had and all the cool stuff that you can do. And I imagine that Berlin is particularly strong because there's so much cool stuff that you can do in the city in general. And now when we talk about that, what are some of the use cases that you all are going over? Yeah, good question. I mean, I can start giving an overview. So um, uh, we, we have a data products team that is kind of organization, like very specialized into shipping machine learning, um, building products with machine learning. And that breaks down into super organization. And there is the growth data products team, for instance, that... Uh, I'm part of where we kind of look into kind of uh, how can we optimize marketing uh, for machine learning. So here there's a lot of bidding topics, there are um, uh, optimization of uh, accounts and uh, entity extraction. And so also in the growth topic area, we also see like retention topics of how you make your customer come back to the platform. So there we have a couple of recommenders. Yeah, so then we have also other teams more on the marketplace side, uh, actually two teams, the travel data products that also have some recommender systems, also into ranking uh, some point of interest also, that's the kind of things that they are doing, so to optimize our web pages. And actually the team I and Olivia are uh, um, mainly on the uh, ranking of the activities, which you can imagine is a really core place of when you are on the, the on any pages which activity you will see is very important to for everyone and here i think i can give back to uh, olivia that can uh, talk a bit more about what our main products here yeah so our main service is the activity ranking service basically uh anytime most pages are loaded um like for instance you go on getyourguide.com and you're planning a trip to Paris, you you type Paris in the search bar. Uh, you could take into a page just for Paris. There's the search service, uh, which does the filtering of the activities, so making sure everything is in Paris. Uh, and then that calls the ranking service, um, our service, uh, that actually does the ordering. And there's quite a bit that goes into it. Obviously, the actual page that we're on is a relevant portion. The user's platform is relevant. You know, different different users on different platforms on desktop, on, on mobile web, uh, from different locales. There's a lot of different elements that can go into the ranking. Um, and yeah, it ends up being quite a bit to manage. We mentioned three teams right now. We are also kicking out a supply team for, for data products that will basically look into how can we automate our supply flow and uh, predict um, like forecasts of tickets and so on. And for supporting all these teams, there's also the machine learning platform team where uh, Megan, I can uh, speak more about. Since the time I joined, which was not too long, uh, beginning of the year. And um, yeah, when I joined, there was a lot of emphasis on people wanting to really observe their uh, models uh, and having the capability to debug it, 
and uh, this was a shift that was uh, that happened in Get Your Guide, which was more like on a retro base where people run into issues, uh, and every team had their own own way of recording metrics and the, with no standardized way of uh, judging how a model uh, performs. Uh, and um, that's when we recently um, onboarded onto this uh, platform called Arise. Uh, and uh, this has been a large shift uh, in terms of um, the culture around model observability um, and uh, in terms of having uh, operational meetings, uh, just like how we monitor our services, uh, any red flags, any anomalies. Uh, we basically do the same for our models and we basically uh, look into all the teams, how, the, how, how our models are doing and making sure there's literally no drift and um, yeah, um, and the, basically our models are still like top notch. So with this, our models are like no more um, a black box. She's a full-time kind of MLOps engineer there and uh, she's leading this op model observability topic. Uh, where we can, among other people, of course, but uh, there is, for instance, this very, that she's nudging right now, this very cool ceremony we have that uh, we are introducing recently where everybody's looking to our model health and uh, uh, how does it drift over time. Uh, so from different data products, teams just get into this meeting and basically we kind of dissect how things are looking over time. This was a big shift from before that we had uh, just this more classical model monitoring where one would set up manual metrics every time this this basically shifted to basically send all the predictions data online that can automatically get monitored so it was a big win of our platform projects i want to take a moment because it feels like there are some organizational pieces that you kind of hit on as being very important but i want to dig into a little bit more one being there was a strong vision from leadership on what the platform was to be. And you had this champion that was your manager and he was helping you all continue to get support. I would love to know what exactly you mean by having the strong vision from upper management. Does that mean that they knew what the platform was going to look like or did they just know that you needed a platform and they were willing to invest whatever it took into it. Yeah, I mean, what's what we got basically, like we, we had like from the start this vision that we need to invest into a, some kind of platform or into infrastructure to specifically for machine learning because it has its unique constraints and we are kind of using a, another language that the rest of the company and ML models have pretty different uh, needs uh, compared to other uh, softwares and we can talk a bit more into the technical aspect of it but it made some time shifts and need to educate some stakeholders and also and so there there was this push on management to explain why we need to have also this infrastructure in place uh, and then it was also giving us the time for us to research uh, and uh, start building proof of concept and show the, the impact of it and here what we what we did uh, with them but is also breaking it down in multiple steps. Basically, we first built, look into training and a batch use case just to build like some kind of framework around that. And we it spent some time on the research side and like we, we were able to prove the impact so that you can explain that to the rest of the infrastructure, the other teams, why we needed to invest this, um, this work, basically. Awesome. Yeah, that makes total sense. What about this other organizational piece around creating rituals to make sure that all the different teams understand the value of babysitting the models or at least having the observability in the models. The rituals are not only for um, the models. So we have um, other, apart from the rituals, we also have dashboards where uh, we can uh, track our best practices around engineering, uh, that's one part, uh, the best practices around engineering for data products. And the other part is the best practices for your model. And uh, I think these are these go hand in hand and these are two uh, big pieces of maintaining our engineering uh, quality. The best practices dashboard is uh, where we have um, things like end-to-end um, -end test cases or are you 
uh, following the latest version of um, some tools uh, or um, yeah, uh, or are using like proper dependency management. Um, yeah, basically things like that. And we also track there the various metrics, like how long it took a data scientist uh, to go from zero to production. So we have like these various metrics and um, to actually push these metrics further, we need rituals. And this is where the rituals come in, where we can um, support and track the progress of teams uh, when it comes to uh, meeting the best practices, both uh, in terms of uh, engineering excellence and also uh, mod model observability. There, there is another aspect I think that is uh, very important is actually uh, we, like Megana is working full-time on ML platform, but actually a lot of, of people participate in, in this. So uh, Jean and I started it, but all engineers at some point and a data scientist at some point or another participated in improving or um, spin up some part of the platform. And this is rewarded in our in our system in how we uh, we see um, performance basically. And so it's not like the ML platform and you have to use it. It's like is the ML platform I help building basically. Yeah, uh, adding on top of that, so uh, this is also our working model of ML platform. So um, I'm like a full-time engineer uh, in ML platform, but uh, we have a working model where uh, we have some concepts which are core uh, from MLP, the features that we think are missing from the platform side and, and numerous uh, other features which, have, which are being contributed by um, engineers or data scientists uh, from the other team, which really helps us uh, enrich this product and also adapted uh, from their eyes uh, so that we are not silos and then we have like a great collaboration uh, because of this uh, working model. It feels like there's a tight feedback loop that since you get to be having these rituals and the data scientists are able to just be, I'm not sure if you're on the same team or you're working very closely together, it's you're able to give feedback on what can be improved and then you can add that to the next sprint if it is prior to prioritized and then uh, go and execute on it. We had a very recent uh, example like uh, I mean development environment is one big topic for us is on our strategy for the year and um, we had an open source tool called DB Rocket to basically build things with uh, notebooks fast. Uh, but now there is like new tools of Databricks that makes it even faster of what we had. And uh, so there was some um, focus group that uh, out of a hack day that uh, basically some folks just get together to analyze some tools. It's outside of the machine and platform project. And they basically um, figure out that there was some better tools um, out of these hack days. And then just like one week later, another engineer, Stephen, that uh, he and and, and Mihail, they just pair together, look into what was the component that was doing this improvement, and they just ported it to our open source tool. And nice. now, like, our development experience has improved significantly, uh, super fast, like, uh, and uh, this is totally outside of, like, roadmap team projects. Or, uh, so it's a big win, very fast, and uh, everybody benefits from it. Love it when that happens. Yeah, that is awesome. So... Let's go down the road of what you actually built and what the evolution was of what you were building. I know we've been dancing around it a bit, but it feels like you've probably got some batch and online use cases. Can you explain to me what what exactly the different components of your ML platform are? Sure. I mean, there's many components, uh, uh, but uh, I will give... I start talking a little bit about the batch uh, example. So it took uh, a deep <laughs> breath there. Like, oh <laughs> yes. my God, am I going to say <laughs> I mean, it all here? Maybe if we can split it up between the four of you. Yes, let, let, let's focus a little bit in the batch. So this was the basically first deliverable of the machine and platform kind of uh, initiative. And uh, um, it basically means like build a system where you can take some kind of spark data frames, transform it, and uh, monitor how that goes over time. So I think that goes a bit towards uh, our definition of data products, that it's machine learning that kind of runs continuously, and uh, you have to kind of keep maintaining it and observing it. Um, yeah, and this was very, we, we came up with a template that was really kind of adopted broadly, 
I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but like in general, we have, must have at least 40 um, kind of data products uh, integrated and uh, every team basically in data products use it. And we are also responding to other teams. Um, one specific example that shines a lot is our search uh, SQR project where we kind of use a bit of go deep into NLP topics, doing some entity, name it entity recognition uh, from user queries in Google. And we bring that back to our page search catalog. That's a very successful project and uh, it's using it. It's building on top of these principles and, and systems that we built. And there are many others. Apple platform uh, in, in its current state is basically a, a group of templates uh, which are tailored for various use cases. So if you want a badge, then uh, you spin up your ML templates uh, with a configuration of batch, and then it uh, sets up uh, like a bare bones a structure for a batch service. Or if you want something oh, with wow. online inference, then it has it sets uh, gets you started with everything you needed uh, need for an online service, and and this and we keep iterating on it um, as we uh, keep evolving. And so, are you using different? Is it like basically? It's like you get to choose your own adventure and say, okay, I need batch templates. Does that mean that you're going to be using different services or is it just that the certain configurations are different? So uh, the only thing right now that differenti differentiates between batch and online is that you you don't, in uh, online services, you have an endpoint that you can call uh, like with an API request, but a batch job that, make, uh, that it misses that, a batch job is mostly uh, like a Databricks run or a Spark job, which is uh, which runs asynchronously um, over long periods of time and we don't need the response immediately. And the online inference um, is built with more tools around like Pento ML, uh, so that now we have like an API like structure um, for it. Um, yeah, so again, you, you choose your services um, based on uh, the service, uh, based on the type of service you want to build. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it really depends on, on the output you're looking for, right? If what you need to build is uh, a service that can handle, uh, like, you know, REST calls, um, then you'll use our, our V2 service template. Um, but if you just need a, a pipeline that produces a, a flat file or uh, even just a model, um, then uh, just a, a batch pipeline is, is sufficient there, right? Um, and, and essentially, just to get into a little bit of the history, Originally, there was only the batch template, um, and there came a point where we launched our first online inference uh, model, which was our, our real-time re-ranker. Um, and so when we launched that, uh, we took a lot of the learnings there and used it to create and refine uh, the, the V2 service template, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, again, going back to this feedback loop, right? Of we, we take these learnings and then we spread them to the rest of data products and gradually improve everything as a whole. Maybe a, a follow up question here, Olivia. I, I mean, we, this real time record is maybe the one of the pr services that uh, I'm most proud of in our organization because uh, it's really kind of a, a first of and a super complex, right? Um, and we've been iterating to it a lot. Maybe you can speak a little bit of how many experiments we run already. Oh gosh! Um, in, in total, I I don't have that number, but our current pace is is quite fast. Uh, I believe it's it's about three per month is is what we what we discussed uh, on average right now. Um, so uh, we're going we're going quite fast. I, I think we must have launched at least thirty, maybe forty uh, experiments, um, and it hasn't been that long uh, since we've actually launched this. So it's it's quite a bit. Um, might even be fifty at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, we really strive to uh, make launching experiments as, as smooth as possible. Having this online inference approach also helps a lot in that regard, makes for a really clean separation between uh, the data science responsibilities and the uh, MLOps engineer side. Um, but yeah, there's there's quite a bit of, of interesting stuff there. All right, so give it to me straight, Olivia. What were some of the biggest pain points when you were creating this experimentation piece like where did you get blocked for weeks on end and you were hitting your head against the wall and you can tell us about so that we can hopefully avoid that when we build something mm. 
Well, for us, the biggest consistent challenge is definitely the latency portion. Um, you, you can imagine what we were doing before, just taking uh, like some pre-calculated scores and doing some really basic arithmetic on them. That doesn't take very long at all. Um, but uh, you know, every time we get a request feeding it to this model, um, which is actually pretty quick uh, for you know for for doing what it's doing, um, you know, compared to other uh, ML models, it's it's quite fast. It only takes on average twenty milliseconds. That's nothing. But our timeout threshold at that time was sixty milliseconds. So all of a sudden, one third of the time is is being consumed, right? Um, so. Um, you know, we, we've gradually raised that threshold, but it, it's a consistent challenge to um, leave enough room in in our in our um, you know spread of latency for the service to do what it needs to do, um, and also have some breathing room for future improvements to the model. Because it could very well be that you know the greatest improvement we can make is one that you know adds another five, another ten milliseconds, and it doesn't sound like that much, but it adds up, right? Um, so um, yeah, it. we. It's 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 a particularly difficult challenge because you don't exactly have a clear goal in mind. You just try things uh, and and hope that they have the effect that you want. That you reduce the latency, you make more room for the model. Um, you know, one one thing we had is uh, we noticed there was some room for improvement in how we did our experimentation. Just just literally how we determined um, which side of an experiment a user was on. Um, we realized that there was some networking overhead that we could save if we just calculated, uh, you know, if we did that uh, variation calculation locally. Um, so, so little things like that they they add up and and uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's something really great to have in mind right from the beginning. Is just where you know where can I save the most time? It's not good to obsess over it. You don't want to over optimize, but um, yeah, keep in mind how much time you have and how much time your model takes. And so when it comes to the experimentation, one thing that I think a lot about is how much were you going to the engineering team or the DevOps team or whoever and thinking about how they do, I imagine some of your teams have feature flags and what they, they're doing with feature flags. Were you trying to draw parallels with what has already been created or did you set out and start off on this new journey and say, okay, ML is different enough to where we can't really take in the learnings of the other teams. I'm sure everyone else also has some input here, but I'll start off by saying um, pretty much I think the first thing we do whenever we start off on on any, uh, quote, new uh, initiative or, or project is, has it been done before? Because the last thing you want to do is, is uh, you know, get 90% or even 100% of the way through something and realize, oh, someone already did it, maybe even did it better. Um, that's the worst. Uh, so, um, yes, and, and we often do, uh, you know, see some work that's already been done or at least take some inspiration. Uh, like this experimentation, for instance, there was already somewhat of a template uh, uh, for, for this framework where we could calculate these variations locally. But there is a challenge um, in, in data products. Uh, primarily, we do everything in Python. Um, and in the rest of the organization, uh, aside from from a couple of exceptions, uh, it's generally not the case. It's mainly in Java. It's mainly Spring Boot. Um, so there are, there are things that don't transfer over, but we, we do try to transfer everything we can. We we try to reuse as much as possible of the current infrastructure. That's that's actually drive us to try to to actually help us make our decision on which tool we want to use. And of course, for ML, there are some tools that are not possible. Like for example, do you have a model registry? No, we don't like as part of the normal engineering thing. So that's why we needed to introduce a new tool, ML tool. Like how do we serve uh, Python services with a, like, with a, like do we have a web services with a model inside? Well, there is nothing like that in the company. So we'll reuse that. However, there are things that we can reuse. We can we can reuse our, the way we we run our our, our CI, uh, how we deploy uh, the CD, and if we could package everything into a Docker container, then we can reuse everything the way like any other services basically. And then we can leverage and not have to build something else on our own just for this. So as much as we as we can, we try to 
reuse or copy things that are been made or somewhere else. And just to add a little bit on top, like, uh, yeah, it's also an existential problem, right? And we don't have staff to build our own separate infrastructure. And I mean, it's much better if you are aligned with the company best practices. We try to keep the abstractions as much as, much as, as, most as possible. So like, um, we have like this development enablement team. We, to develop our services, we build on top of their stack already. We run our production systems in our Kubernetes cluster that is shared among everybody. We have a data platform team that we just specialize on top. We don't like, try to do the same things as them. So um, I think, uh, yeah, that that's part of why we've been successful with this project is that uh, we really try to be team players that only specialize when we really needed it. Hey, Laszlo here. If you are serious about MLOps, you hit subscribe right now. Yeah, I feel like when you talk about the data platform team, I've really been seeing something, and I'll try and explain how I see it in my head, but inevitably it's not going to be as eloquently as I see it in my head. Let's see if language doesn't fail me now. The data platform team is like a foundation. It's like the bedrock of all of the different use cases that you can do with data, right? And then off of that, you have the pillars. Maybe it's an analytics use case. Maybe it's a ML use case. And you have potentially new platforms that spur off of it that are these pillars like the ML pillar. And so talk to me about how the ML platform taps into the data foundation, which is the data platform. And also completely disagree with me if you think that that's not the right way to look at it too. Yeah, we we, uh, we try to solve the problem of taking machine learning as a machine learning platform pro, pro system, put it in production, and run it in production. That's the problem we try to solve. Our data platform team is so much bigger than that, right? They have to connect our events. They have to make sure our data is in the right place and so on. We also need clean data. But uh, I mean, we uh, here also, Olivia for sure can, can, can chime in it's like, we are into discussions where at the moment, like, oh, data platform has a tool for observability. And we need also like data observability. Uh, they have a tool for that. So how can we make sure that our use cases are integrated? That's something we would like to have. Not always is possible that we need a bit of specialization, but uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the, where's the clear place that the data platform stops and the ML platform starts and is there, some things that can cross over onto both, like a data observability. You need them in both. And so how can you take advantage of the fact that you're already using that for the data platform and just extend it to the ML platform? Yeah, I think it kind of, um, I don't know, the way I think about it is sort of like breadth versus depth, right? Uh, The data platform has uh, quite a lot of breadth. They have to validate, um, you know, all of the data. um, But uh, you know, we will use, you know, one or two events very heavily. Um, you know, we have some very specific use case where we need some specific field to have some specific value in the right cases. Uh, and these, these uh, you know, the analytics events we use are, are published by teams across the company. So, you know, every team is kind of publishing analytics data about, you know, what they're doing. We ourselves send out, uh, you know, ranking served events. Every time we do a ranking, we say, these, this is the ranking we performed. These were the activities involved. This is why we ranked the way we did. This is the data we used to do it. Um, so, you know, it, it's quite a bit of data to handle. And so for our use case, if something is out of place and that messes up one of our models, that could easily be something that data platform who has to worry about all of the events and and the consistency overall, they could easily escape their notice, right? Um, so so uh, managing that is, is uh, a challenge right now. I really like this idea of, yeah, breadth versus depth and how uh, long live those data engineers. I'll tell you what, they've got their work cut out for them. Not that you all don't either, but man, there's a lot that goes into that. And so thinking about all of the different things that the data engineers need to, all of that data that they're collecting and moving around, how tightly are you working with them to make sure that... uh, when you're experimenting with new things and you need new data, they know that. And how easy is that transition to just, is it just a ping on Slack and say, hey, can I get this data now? And can you 
give it to me in this package or in this format. And uh, if it refreshes every two seconds or two milliseconds, that would be great. Uh, I, I can talk about this briefly, but I think everyone else also has input. Um, essentially, I think Data Platform does their best to make sure everything is as hands-off as possible. So in general, um, uh, there might be some exceptions, but uh, they're usually not directly supplying the data that we use. They're setting up the systems like the Kafka topics, the pipelines um, that you know carry it from one place to another. So when there's a problem there, for sure, uh, you know, we'll contact data platform. Um, but in, in general, uh, if we have some problem with some specific event, say, we can usually reach directly out to the team. Maybe, you know, the issue there is, is a more systemic one, in which case we need to reach out to data platform. Um, but generally, uh, we're able to be much more direct. And yeah, maybe to just complement here, I think one key value in Get Your Guide is that we really value self-service and uh, like, you should the teams that produce the data they are also the owners of the data and uh if you so it's not on on this single like uh data platform team to take care of this and uh, rather that distribute that concern but rather but i would ne nevertheless also like us to focus a little bit in data testing which is something we developed uh which i also very happy about and uh proud of because i don't think it's something that we seeing a lot in the industry still, and it's an idea that we want to share with you. Just uh, real quick to clarify, when you say data testing, you're talking about the data that you are getting from the data platform or these Kafka streams that Olivia was mentioning, and just you're checking to make sure that everything is green and flowers and tie-dye and all that good stuff? Yes, more or less. I mean, exactly. Like if, when you have any kind of data products, you're trying to model, actually, you, you, you need two things. You need the code and you need the data. And actually, if you look at software, like everyone agrees, you should test your code. That's good practices. But for machine learning, I think not, it's not as clear. Like people say, yeah, you should test your code. But I mean, your final product depends on the code and, but it also depends on the data. So. I think that's what we we, we say. We, you should also test your data the same way you test your code, because otherwise, you will end up with a bad product, like, and then you will you will also have bad recommendation, bad predictions. So here, like, uh, we we looked into tools to help us how we could basically test our data. So there is some open source tool like Great Expectations, yeah, uh, but also where we needed to to figure out a way is how do we want to also integrate that as part of our development process. So to, to have a good way to know when we change something in the code, how will that interact with the data that we have to make sure that it will, it makes sense. And if we are making a wrong join, they are technically right in, in the code, but if the join now makes that we have no raw output, so your model is trained on no rows, you have a problem and you should also check that in some way with some production data. And that's why we, we put this place. So we, uh, I mean, John, uh, open source this, uh, this tool, D data flow, um, which is around, uh, sampling techniques. And we can then combine with great expectation, uh, to basically help us validate, um, validate our codes and also being able to run that as part of a CI, because if we want to run all the full data set, then it explodes basically because it will take way too long. But with the data flow, then we're able to sample the sources. Also, we're able to download some uh, subset uh, in our laptop to have faster development loop. And also, we can run it as part of a CI, this um, uh, this uh, sampling uh, data set so that we have a kind of rough idea of with the sample data set, is it still valid, basically? So you d will not have the best model yeah, uh, I was just going to briefly add, um, I think the most valuable part of DataFlow is, is the abstraction, right? Uh, you just say, get me the data, and then you can configure somewhere else uh, using environment variables, uh, using you know arguments, whatever, um, where exactly that comes from. It's, it's, it's not a trivial problem at all when you have um, something that's, uh, that has you know, 12, 20, however many uh, different areas it needs to pull data from. You know, what do you do to, to make sure it works? Do you 
create sample uh, data for all of those different sources, that's quite a lot to maintain. Um, so just just having this uh, this abstraction on top of that um, helps quite a bit. Well, so this sounds like something that is really useful for other teams. So earlier I was asking about how you make sure that you can not reinvent the wheel when you're building the ML platform, but it feels like this would be useful for the analytics team or also for the data platform. Did it go the other way where you realized, hey, we made something really cool here. Maybe the data platform wants to use this. Not yet. I would say uh, uh, the, I mean, the, that we have one clear kind of uh, um, barrier, which is the stack, right? We are Python um, basic first and uh, most of the rest of the organization use different technologies. Um, at the same time, like we are working to kind of expanding our, our, our like customers in the machine learning platform team to kind of also extend to analysts and uh, and uh, the broader engineer organization and the data pro. But uh, coming back to your question, like the data platform team also have such a need of data end to end tests. Uh, yeah. So we are kind of in communication to see if there is something kind of a, at least they can be inspired by our solution. But uh, it's rather p- very Pythonic. So. Um, yeah, would be hard to port one to one. Um, I think one thing to also be said on the two is that uh, I mean, it's. I think it has a very good re- ROI for investment. Like it's it's not unit data and to, data test. It's like data end to end test, meaning that you replace your entire pipeline with these data sources that we use subsets of production data, um, and then you are sure that your pipeline runs end to end. Then you can further kind of invest in great, great expectations to make it even more kind of uh, refine the checks. But uh, the fact that we can have one guarantee on the CI level that every time we make a change, the whole pipeline works, that uh, is like high, uh, there's a high return of investment. Uh, if you would create very particular scenarios every time for each one corner case of your data, that would get very fast, stale and uh, very hard to maintain. So I think we, we achieve a good balance there. The, the last thing, I think maybe one of the, the biggest impact of this uh, mind shift and technique like we have in right, basically it helped us a lot for the, our, our ranking service where we have our real-time ranking as we're iterating at this uh, loop of iteration of like three three or more uh, experiment uh, per month. And that's a big part of it is basically thanks to this tool that basically now we know that we have this end-to-end test where it's using a sample data, trying to train a model on it, trying to integrate it to a service, run uh, integration tests, all over that. And basically this allows the data scientists that do not have like the full understanding of the uh, of the service itself to basically make that change, push them. If the CI pass, everyone is pretty confident that it will pass. So they don't need like to to have to pair every time with a uh, with MLOps. I mean, we value collaboration and we pair from time to time. But like by default now, to launch an experiment, we don't have every time needed the uh, MLOps and data scientists as we we have put in place the system of throughput testing end to end and integrate and making sure that the integration work. Yeah, you cannot underestimate that freedom. At, at pretty much every level, um, we try to make sure our systems are, are as resilient as they can be and as free of, of manual either intervention or just worry, uh, anxiety. Um, you know, at, at any point if something goes wrong, um, you will be notified. You won't have to proactively check, right? Um, even if our, our ranking system goes down, for instance, we have a backup score that runs uh, on the search service that calls it, right? And in this case, um, you know, our worst case scenario uh, is that the ranking is just slightly worse, um, but still reasonable. Um, so um, every uh, at every point in the process, we're thinking about this, right? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, makes it a lot easier to sleep at night, I'm sure. So yeah, guess, that helps. <laughs> yes, I guess with data science, it's you can really do this, right, that you have or I'd say we are in a very privileged domain. We are talking about travel where if things break, they kind of, it's not a natural disaster or something like this. But uh, uh, at the same time, with data science, you can do a lot for kind of, it's usually optimization. So you can have a resilient fallback and then you cannot 
do on call on the weekend in many use cases. That's in the case for the real time ranker, and uh, I mean, there are others. So uh, I think being in this domain is also very good because you can also like experiment more and and uh, uh, yeah, learn from putting things in production and so on. Yeah, that's true. That's a whole different way of looking at it is that you're more able to take chances because you know that if it passes, you're more secure. So you can push the limits a little bit more because you have all of those guardrails set up and if there is something that is bad, you'll get notified about it uh, unless you find that anomaly and you take everything down. The whole site goes down with it. And then you gotta, you're gotta you going to have a fun retro. But that sounds like, that sounds like it's a, in a really good spot. What I'm curious about, and this is especially interesting for you, Megana, which uh, since you've been around for eight months, you've gotten to see the evolution of, over these eight months, but you've also gotten to think about what could be better. I imagine you came in with some totally clear eyes. And when you got here, maybe there are things that you have wanted to implement or you would have implemented differently. Do you have anything like that for us where it's like, okay, we took this design decision turn along the way, but maybe if we hadn't have done that, it could have made it easier for us to do X, Y, Z now that we're here and we're in this position. Basically, the TLDR of this question is, you got any regrets? So uh, we have our teams in such a way that uh, we make sure we don't have regrets, right? So we don't have things on back of our mind. We regularly have retros. And if there's anything, if there's any any pressing need, it becomes um, a roadmap item um, or or like um, a focus day uh, in a sprint or um, or things like that. And um, and I think that your guide has a very inclusive culture where um, we can like clearly um, express uh, the things that are not quite right that can be improved. And um, yeah, we have like a, a massive support uh, of of people that can also jump in and and help us so that um, in the end, like you say, we don't have any regrets. Um, yeah, but. Uh, Yes, but there, I'm sure that there's still like a bunch of uh, stuff that there is still missing that we can still improve, like improving our online service or improving the rates at which we can launch uh, new services or expanding to newer domains now, like with the LLMs um, and iterating fast uh, on on this track um, and uh, to bring more uh, data products which are using LLMs into production. So these are uh, some improvements that we are always looking at and um, trying to get into the roadmap and stay abreast with the, as much as with the current technology as well. Yeah, let's go deeper down that rabbit hole. Like what is next for the platform? I guess we should just go over what LLM use cases are you doing? What are you doing with LLMs right now? And then how do you see that evolving over the next three to six months? Right. So ever since ChatGPT or OpenAI uh, came uh, with the, the new announcement of um, yeah, you know, ChatGPT, so there was like a, an explosive moment inside Get Your Guide, and everybody found like use cases for their product to improve. And there's still this explosion, and now we are trying to identify uh, the um, and streamline this process of identifying the uh, products that have uh, the great impact and uh, trying to uh, basically um, productionalize uh, those uh, those products which we think have the highest impact. And um, so so right now we're still in this iteration where we are trying to um, get requirements uh, for people who want to do this. And we are working with the, uh, the data scientists, for example, um, we worked on unwanted content detection for uh, the search queries. So we don't want a uh, search query being triggered for um, uh, for uh, search query terms which are really not uh, ethical, um, so we basically used uh, ChatGPT there to um, on a mass scale um, identify these search uh, query terms uh, so that we exclude them uh, uh, from our um, uh, paid uh, paid search uh, or paid triggered ads. Um, and this was like a success story, and uh, we had like um, uh, like a great uh, uplift in our experiments. 
um, and um, but now we want to uh, make that quite general for other people because I'm sure like there are also other teams who want to productionalize uh, this kind of a use case. They have like their prompts ready now. They just want to um, like have their product in production. And uh, so we are heading in the direction where one of the use cases is to uh, productionalize this ChatGPT kind of a use case. And on the other hand, uh, we have uh, our data scientist called Stefan, uh, who is trying to uh, do a supplier based onboarding. AI based onboarding for supplier, yes. Yeah, AI based onboarding for supplier. Um, so we have this feature called uh, Instant Go Live, where uh, a supplier for, uh, for the tours, uh, he can enter his content and we don't need like freelancers to uh, check the content. It can uh, use uh, LLMs to um, analyze this content and correct it as per get your guide guidelines and uh, instantly go live. Uh, so this is another uh, LLM use case that we see is uh, very promising in improving our supplier onboarding experience. Uh, and I'm also working with um, Stefan uh, with this to recognize his uh, requirements when it comes to uh, professionalizing LLMs. And as soon as this is done, uh, we also uh, want to make it more generic for um, the other other uh, products as well, so that they can uh, be more uh, more self serve. So this is the major um, major bet we have in the upcoming quarter. Yeah, maybe just to add on that, uh, like uh, uh, we we don't um, we don't feel that we that people don't need to use these templates that we are working on, right? Uh, they can also. I mean, we, we want to make it like so good that they feel compelled to, but uh, uh, they should not be blocked for us. So, uh, uh, but what you you asked it also, uh, what is people can do it on themselves, and that's true to a certain extent. But there are some aspects that are also unique of this uh, domain. Like, uh, I mean, it's very easy to create a demo with HGP, but to productionalize it is more challenging and. Uh, um, also, like the whole topic of observability on LLMs is like a new field that uh, um, that requires kind of some or like even like just basic things like a cost estimation of running LLMs at scale or like uh, some sort of uh, uh, um, yeah rate limiting for when you're calling out Obey AI. Megan also work into this how to fine tune rate limiting. So there are tons of topics that are from a platform point of view one needs to start working on uh, and uh, but for sure people can get started with their LLM very fast everywhere uh, still we want to make it better and of course we have all the things that are also here coming through like we also are looking into some internal or uh, external chatbots uh, for example with the with Slack integrated with Slack to help us uh, question faster so that we don't do it um, uh, also around the reviews. So there we have a lot of uh, other use cases that we're testing. So we see a lot of potential here. Well, so this is the fascinating part for me. It's that the people who are bringing up these use cases, I imagine a lot of them are not data scientists or have nothing to do with the machine learning team. And so they're coming to you and saying, you know what, like I hacked something together with the API over the weekend. And I think it could be really cool if we productionize this. So it feels like you've probably been bombarded with all of those people from your company and you have to figure out some kind of ticketing system on how to integrate all of them in. And again, it goes back to this, this big question that I have is that you being very Python centric, it, Jean, you kind of were saying, well, don't let that be a blocker. If somebody wants to get something out there, they can and they don't have to use Python. Have you thought about, well, maybe we need to expand beyond Python because so many people that are asking us for use cases are not coming to us in Python and they're coming in different languages? Or is that it doesn't even matter? It's you've got bigger fish to fry, as they say. Yeah, I think um, in, in our core group, we, I mean, we, at the same time, we stimulate people to be kind of more full stack and go and block themselves when the need, I think, uh, would be kind of a, a stretch to to kind of invest into supporting new languages uh, for our current kind of team size would, yeah, at the same, yeah. So my tendency would be, uh, let's build strong foundations what we have. And when people have use cases that match, they come to us. 
Yes, yes. Uh, and we we have also like for instance an AI interest group where people go and they solve problems together. Um, and I mean, if it's very easy to call ChatGPT and solve a problem, all the power to the people. And like let let's do that. Uh, let's not be a blocker here. I think uh, there will be some use cases that we really want to use our tooling set because we want to observe things. We want to uh, control for uh, constraints that we have. And those might feed our platform, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the future will be very diverse and uh, we want basically accommodate on it. That's my I imagine your <laughs> DevSecOps team has got to love that AI uh, study group for whatever it is, a use case group, because I am guessing they come up with a lot of ideas and then the DevSecOps team is just like, wait, what? You're going to do... You're going to take what data and give it to who and where? And <laughs> Hold on a minute. So that's got to be a lot of fun thinking about it. But again, going back to this this idea, I really find it fascinating too, Mayana, how you were saying you're trying to prioritize which use cases are going to be the most useful and the lowest hanging fruit or how I look at it as like the least amount of effort to get the highest ROI. What metrics like what helps you decide that and how do you make those decisions yeah so this decision is not made by me alone right so we still have our management we still have our managers who have their business metrics um in place uh, maybe jean you can uh, expand on um, on those metrics what they are uh, but yeah in the end we um it's it's a guided effort by our managers and our our mentors to um, yeah suggest uh, like projects which can help help us grow and the help the organize organization grow in terms of impact. Um, yeah, so um, it's basically not me deciding this. So it's probably me like suggesting. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, it's like it's a guided in this roadmap a discussion with our managers and with the organization uh, we are aligned. Maybe just add to that like. Uh... There is, yeah, it's a continual conversation. AMLP, I think over time we kind of narrow down to some strategic pillars that we want to invest on, like uh, increasing the amount of data processing production. One part of by uh, one part of that is onboarding new kind of parts of the organization, reduce the the operational costs of running the, them. Uh, also, by increasing the adoption, we have to do a lot of work into kind of reducing um, the onboarding costs so documentation and making sure that everything is in place uh the ver- development environment so i think this metrics for mlp make a lot of sense then uh, another thing that came rushing was llms and then that has to be in the roadmap and we have to work on this and build an opinion and and, and build solutions so uh but it, it's very nuanced i think that the best outcomes nevertheless came out of a reaction to a need on our data products team so like for instance data and to end tests we were feeling the 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 pain point again and again, and then we decided to act together and uh, solve the problem, and uh, that was really appreciated. So, yeah, um, it, it, so I would say it's very dynamic. Uh, but uh, once we have a goal, we write, we go drive it through the kind of finishing line, uh, and uh, yeah. So there is something that I want to just touch on. The last thing I think that we can talk about, which is. I see here in the little form that I asked you all to fill out before we started talking and someone put in here that the data science slash ML team makes money. Oh, I wrote that as well. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what, uh, why our organization exists, right? We believe that we can add a lot of value to a project. Uh, I need our organization like data products within Azure Guide because by making intelligent uh, data-based decisions and uh, I mean, we, yeah. And it's the scale that we are that right now is like pretty kind of uh, feasible and uh, as part of, yeah, the machine learning platform team, I feel that there we can help basically to get those things fast into production. And then there is an, an huge topic about what to build and uh, with our product managers and so on. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm pretty happy where we stand and the whole progress we did with, uh, yeah. But so how are you measuring, how do you know that you're making money, I guess? How are you sure of it? And because of course, 
if you can easily quantify that, then it gives you a lot of firepower when your boss or your boss's boss goes into the meetings and needs to advocate for you to have more budget for better platform or to hire more people to work on the platform, et cetera, et cetera. So what are some things that you can clearly say? Yeah, I, I, I can tell you like, it depends on the project, but like for us on the marketplace, we are mainly evaluate based on how successful our, our experiments or our new model is. And then based on that, basically we have, um, uh, we have an experimentation, uh, services that we run and basically that's how we evaluate all what we do. And that basically put a tag on how much money uh, we we are able to to launch by a new model, or we are gaining every day or every month. So that's that's how we get it. Yeah, no, that that's it. We evaluate through experiments uh, in growth data products. Uh, there are marketing experiments, a bit different setup, but uh, then the other marketplace uh, uh, where you can really grant kind of a, a split on. Uh, groups there we have to basically split split other logical uh, like where in marketplace you can split on kind of some populations of customers in, in marketing you have to split by kind of entities on your ads uh, kind of uh, portfolios so uh, it's a bit different but we reach the same conclusions uh, regarding Avatar as a um, ML platform I think uh, here is just it, it, we don't measure like uh, financial gains of course we can get some gains into kind of causes and so on. But uh, I think that what really moves the needle for us is like the productivity of pushing uh, data science projects to production. Yeah, with with, uh, with internal things, it's harder, right? Um, but yeah, experimentation is the big one. And then the other side, as far as cutting costs go, um, we have a pretty decent idea of where we spend money split by team, split by service. Um, and so whenever we make an improvement there, we can, we can, uh, detect it pretty quickly. So cool. Well, it seems like you all have spent a considerable amount of time building out the platform and a lot of thought and really learning, iterating and executing on a level that I'd love to see because it is not uh, the baby steps anymore. It feels like it's quite mature. And so I appreciate you coming on here, telling us all about it. I also appreciate, I got to give a shout out to the Berlin community. The MLOps Berlin community is incredible. I know you all are in Berlin. I think everybody's in Berlin. I didn't, I didn't yes. ask. Yeah. All right. So you're all in Berlin and I know Theo and John, you are heavily active in the MLOps community Berlin chapter. So I thank you for that because I get to reap the benefits. I get to use it as an excuse to go to Berlin and enjoy the local meetups that you all organize. And I, uh, am, I'm thankful for that. And uh, uh, also, like, I would like to shout out that, the, I mean, in GetRobed, we do a lot of community work, like TU has been organizing PyData also, and it's great to, I think the best outcomes happen when we kind of get these communities together. And uh, yeah, so really happy with uh, all of that. And we also, as GetRobed, took a lot from the me podcast right uh, even like the MLOps engineer role this is a kind of something that came out of after making this time getting kind of consolidated and that helps I mean I think to a big part was due to the work you've been doing here with uh, the meetup and so on so with uh, sorry the the website the community the slack channel everything I love hearing that that's music to my ears well thank you all I think we'll end it there Hey everyone, my name is Aparna, founder of Verizon, and the best way to stay up to date with MLOps is by subscribing to this podcast.